everybody, welcome back. Uh, another little episode of Shelf Life, but uh, I'm going to admit this time it is not my shelves. <laughs> so this is the cheat episode, uh, wherein these books are actually not owned by me. Um, these are owned by my dad, but uh, I used to read them quite often uh, when I still lived at home and kind of grew up with them. And uh, I still like to borrow them every now and then because they're such fantastic reads. So uh, the author today is, this is a twofer, so the author today is uh, a man called Fred Saberhagen. Let me see if I can get the glare off that. There we go. Uh, so we've got the Dracula tape, and we've also got the Holmes Dracula file. So starting off with uh, this one, the Dracula tape. So Fred Saberhagen is also a writer of science fiction and fantasy, uh, short stories, novels, things like that. And um, the reasoning for going into sort of a line of Dracula novels was he said he had been reading Bram Stoker's Dracula and was really struck by the fact that even though like Dracula is the titular character, he only appears in it like right at the very beginning and right at the very end, you know? So, I mean, he's barely in it, but he's supposed to be the topic of the entire book kind of thing. So he caught himself wondering, like, so what's Dracula doing this whole time? Like, what are his motivations? Like, what does he think of of the situation? Like, you know, what would he have done, like, in behind the scenes while, you know, the others were planning on hunting him down and killing him? Like, what kind of a person was Dracula? So he decided to go ahead and write uh, the Dracula tape to kind of explore that question. Um, and what came out was like a really sort of unique kind of Dracula series, I guess, because there were several several books in, in the Dracula series. Um, and this was published in 1975. And something that I thought of actually this time around when I reread this, because it had been a while, uh, was that that was three years before um, Anne Rice wrote Interview with the Vampire. And I'm kind of wondering if, like, the sort of format of this was maybe inspirational to Anne Rice, because uh, in this book, Dracula is basically recording his story um, for, like, a couple, in this case, like, a man and a woman. But he's using, like, this recorder and, you know, what he sees as like modern technology like cassette tapes and, and things like that at that point i think this takes place in like the 19 no i think it takes place in maybe about like 1968 or 70 or something like that around there um so i just thought that was kind of interesting that like Anne race kind of used that same sort of format for louis to tell his story you know um, to a reporter who was recording it like on a cassette kind of in a deserted environment or whatever so I thought that was kind of neat probably is no connection but kind of fun to think of so anyways um, in this book uh, Fred Saberhagen gives like a really not like a sympathetic kind of portrait of Dracula but sort of I mean he is basing it completely on the historical figure of uh, Blatt sorry Vlad Stefish, Stefish, that's how you say it, um, you know, ruler of uh, Wallachia in the uh, 15th century. Um, so instead of the creation myth for this uh, was that Vlad was killed, but by sort of a transcendent effort of will, he reanimated himself. So it's not like he was made into a vampire you know, by being bitten or anything like that. Um, so it's kind of neat because even he himself isn't sure how that happens and he doesn't really know how he can do things like, um, you know, transubstantiate into like a mist form, which he can also do in the Bram Stoker novel as well too, um, or transform into like a bat. Like he doesn't know how that happens and he freely admits he's like, oh, you know, so that's kind of neat. Um, but in this book, like Fred Saberhagen really goes into the processes and the motivations of like why Dracula is doing things, 
why he wants to move to England. Um, you know, he's pretty well, essentially tired of his backwater, you know, in the Carpathians and wants to kind of join with the new Western, you know, society and industrial revolution is happening. All these new thoughts and, you know, science and all this sort of stuff. And, you know, he wants to, you know, be more human, like, get close to it, experience new things, technologies, uh, you know, the new type of people and things like that. So this is like why he decides to move. But because he's still such a very honor bound, um, you know, aristocratic kind of person, you know, him and, you know, the people of the age, like say Jonathan Arker, for instance, like, don't really see eye to eye on like why Dracula does certain things, even though they might seem perfectly logical to Dracula. And so this inspires like Jonathan to, you know, eventually think that he's being kept a prisoner in the castle and all this sort of stuff. And he goes kind of insane and, you know, thinks that, uh, you know, Dracula is like the devil and, and this whole sort of thing. Right. So it kind of goes downhill from there. Um, but, through it, like, I have to say, Saberhagen offers up some really good explanations for why vampires do things and for how vampires do things. Um, you know, he essentially makes them live on, you know, animal blood and drinking from, like, people, especially, you know, women, he said is just, frankly, a sexual thing. It's not necessarily for food, you know, um, even though like the tackle doesn't work, it's more of like a psychological, emotional thing, right? So it's really kind of neat in that respect. Um, so spoiler alert, uh, Dracula actually goes on to develop a relationship with Mina Harker behind Jonathan's back, but um, she still loves Jonathan. So they end up staying together and Mina and Dracula essentially create this entire ruse wherein, you know, Helsing and the party and whatnot end up chasing him to Europe and up to his castle and, you know, thinking that they killed him like right before sunset and everyone was free and all this sort of stuff. So they essentially trick them into thinking that Dracula is dead when he's not. And uh, Mina lives a full long life marries Jonathan, has kids, this, that, and the other thing. And uh, when she dies, because they have exchanged so much, you know, blood during their little rendezvous kind of thing, their little affairs throughout the years, she does eventually rise again as a vampire. It takes a couple of years this time, but that at the very beginning of this novel, that's what Dracula is on his way to do is essentially go and collect her from the cemetery where she was buried. And uh, he contrives to have a couple of her descendants, uh, a man and a woman, um, you know, trap them in this car in this horrendous snowstorm that he has rigged up um, and decides to finally come clean and, and tell this sort of backstory of his life and uh, you know, Mina's life. So really cool. You really get an affinity for Dracula. He is so completely persecuted in this book. Um, and you really realize Bram Stoker's writing has a shit ton of flaws in it, really. Um, the biggest one being like, because medical science, when that was written, was definitely not good. Um, a lot of things were not understood and Dracula points this out. I mean, they haven't even discovered blood types yet. And so when Van Helsing is, you know, giving all these like blood transfusions to Lucy Westendra, like trying to keep her from dying, he's actually poisoning her blood with incompatible blood. So technically, he was responsible for Lucy's death. You know, Dracula didn't kill her. Van Helsing killed her. You know, just kind of little things like that, which are really cool. So, yeah, so that is The Dracula Tape uh, by Fred Saberhagen. And the other one that I wanted to show you was the second book in this series. Um, I don't know how many there are in total. I think there's like maybe like five or six. And uh, this one is one of my favorites because it pulls in my other man, 
Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> so Dracula and Sherlock Holmes. I've got a couple of books that are like Dracula Holmes kind of related. And it's like one of my favorite sort of uh, duos in, in fiction. Um, so this one was published uh, a couple of years later. I think this is like 79, I want to say. 78. So this book is as old as me. <laughs> And um, essentially in it, like, you know, Dracula, it's several years later. The first book took place in 1891. This one takes place in like 1897, 1897. So several years later, you know, Dracula's hanging out in London. He's like living there. He's, he's doing his thing. Um, and uh, in this sort of bizarre twist, again, spoilers, uh, he ends up uh, getting abducted as a patient for these crazy medical experiments by this mad doctor type um trying to find out essentially like cures for the plague but since he was like knocked so hard on the head with like a wooden cudgel he develops some amnesia and stuff like that so metal metal doesn't do shit to vampires but wood there's a problem with that so for a while, like for the first, you know, half of the book, he can't remember who the hell he is or what he is. Um, and so eventually he ends up, you know, escaping that situation when his captors think that they have killed him because he's a shitty test subject. So the other part of this that ties in the Dracula, the Holmes angle anyway, uh, is a another case um, involving the blackmail of uh i'll say the royal family basically by this crazy doctor who um you know had moved on from trying to find a cure to the plague to basically saying i'll let loose the plague on london unless you give me you know millions of dollars pounds so it's turned into a, a blackmail event and uh the other plot going on there's like three things happening in here for Sherlock Holmes is that uh, the original doctor who set off to, uh, you know, discover the cure for this plague in Sumatra, uh, his fiance shows up when he seems to have mysteriously disappeared. So all three of these things are kind of running at the same time. Um, and the really, different thing that Saberhagen did in this book too was that uh, he links Dracula's heritage with that of Sherlock Holmes but not through Dracula through Dracula's brother Radu so he kind of took with the fact that Sherlock in the canon anyway by Conan Doyle doesn't talk a lot about his childhood or his upbringing you know like a few things about him but not much and he kind of takes that and runs with it and uh it's a really unique take on like a Sherlock Holmes origin story and why he is the way he is and things like that um so quite interesting there I have to say he's one of the one of the best writers to sort of channel Conan Doyle's voice like Sherlock Holmes voice as well too so you really kind of like don't um you really believe that like you're reading about Holmes you know you're not kind of pulled out of that fantasy by like not the right like dialogue or not the right relationship with Watson or things like that but uh at the at the very end it's kind of neat because Sherlock and Dracula end up um kind of as allies uh, against this plague doctor, um, who, surprise, twist ending, like M. Night Shyamalan level shit here, uh, is Dr. Seward, who was one of the main players, the owner of the Lunatic Asylum in London, uh, of Renfield fame, from Bram Stoker's Dracula. Uh, and he had come across this lady's fiance looking for the source of plague in Sumatra um, and just kind of took his place. 
So the link to the Holmes thing, if you watched my episode on the exploits of Sherlock Holmes, that um, book from the 1950s that uh, Aidan Conan Doyle, Arthur's younger son, um, co-wrote, where he essentially took references to cases in the canon that had never been written about and wrote about them. So he kind of like made up these cases that were referenced in Sherlock Holmes stories. Um, and that's kind of like what Fred Saberhagen did in this one. Uh, because one of the things that Watson references in the canon is the giant rat of Sumatra, which he said he never wrote about because the world was not yet prepared to hear the story. And so the source of the plague in this book is this giant rat rodent from Sumatra that gets brought back to England um, and is the source of all the crazy experimentation um, that uh, the doctors were doing. So that's kind of the tie in there. So really interesting book, um, great crossover between like Holmes and Dracula without losing like the feel of the Dracula established in the first book, Dracula Tape, um, and, but also continuing Conan Doyle's um, feel for like Sherlock Holmes and, and his style of writing in canon as well too. Uh, so absolutely fantastic. Um, if you want me to do any more of uh, Saber Hagen's Dracula series books, uh, I would be super happy to like reread them <laughs> and refresh my memory for you. Um, because like as they get like kind of further into um, like the seventies and things like that, uh, the books get like not the publishing date further into the 70s but i mean like as the story goes um you know time is going on and so like the later stories take place in like you know the early like 1900s like 1920s 30s and then the 60s 70s and then the 80s so um you know it's not static like that it's, it's like time is actually going on and, and dracula is having interactions with the, the Harker descendants and things like that, and eventually becomes sort of like the family protector. So if you want to see any more of Fred Saberhagen's um, Dracula series books done by me on here, let me know. Um, I know this has been a bit of a longer video, but uh, I had a lot to say about these ones. So thanks a lot, and uh, let me know what you want to see in the comments, okay?